Hello, my name is Eric Miranda, and this is my presentation on single read articulation and how it affects our perception of music. This presentation will focus on the tongue's ability to alter the attack and release of a sound envelope. Next, this project will examine how these alterations affect our perception of musical expression. And the sources used for this presentation will focus mostly on single read articulation. What is a sound amplitude envelope? This question will be briefly answered by exploring the second edition of Music in the Human Experience by Donald Hodges. After that, what can we learn from the attack and release portions of the envelope? This portion of the project will examine how attack and release portions of an envelope are measured and how we can infer meaning from the results based on statistical data. Then, how do musical parameters like dynamics and tempo affect attack and release transients? This will be explored by asking a few questions like, how do researchers examine multiple effects on a dependent variable? And how can this information be shown visually? And what lessons can be learned pedagogically? Lastly, how do these portions of the envelope affect our perception of music? There are two studies that will be discussed that attempt to answer the question, what is the impact of articulation and attack transients on how we derive meaning from music? So first, what is a sound envelope? Donald Hodges defines sound envelopes as changes that occur over the course of a single sound. These changes include an attack, decay, sustain, and release. The attack portion refers to the length of time that a sound takes to rise from nothing to an initial peak. Decay is the settling in of musical tones after they reach the first peak amplitude. Sustain is a tone's period of constant sound and can contain changes like dynamics or vibrato. The release portion is the length of time it takes for the sound to fall to nothing after the note is released. And all of this is diagrammed in figure one. This presentation will focus primarily on the attack and decay of a sound envelope. The reason for this is that those sections of the envelope are where the tongue articulates to initiate the sound and eventually is engaged again to stop the sound. Starting and ending sound without the tongue will also be briefly examined as it is a valid articulation that is used across all wind instruments. So what can be learned from the attack and release transients of an amplitude envelope? Amplitude envelopes are important for helping listeners identify and infer meaning from sound. The example Hodges uses in his text to explain this concept compares a guitar and a clarinet. When looking at the Fourier or harmonic analysis for a clarinet and a guitar, the two may be easily mistaken for the other based on that information alone. However, if you were to analyze their amplitude envelopes, it would then become clear which sound envelope belongs to which instrument. That being said, if the attack and or release are removed from the sound envelope, it would make identifying instruments much more challenging, as will be discussed later. And lastly, the attack and release of a sound envelope is important for conveying meaning in musical phrasing. Learning more about these portions of the amplitude envelope will provide a better understanding of ensemble playing and musical expression. The first study to be explored is by Basileo Chatianu and Alex Hoffman. Chatianu and Hoffman published a study called Modeling Articulation Techniques in Single Reed Woodwind Instruments. This was published in the Acoustical Society of America journal in 2013. In this study, saxophone players were recorded during portato playing, which is defined as a normal length articulation, where articulation is achieved by the use of the tongue or by modulating the airflow into the mouthpiece, i.e. air release. 
The bending of the reed, which they call reed displacement, and the pressure inside the mouthpiece are measured with the aim at capturing transient effects. The two researchers then used a mass spring model to try to simulate the results that the human performer achieved. Chachianu and Hoffman claim that the starting attack portion of the amplitude envelope is usually an important identifying feature of an instrument's character and how easily it can be played. This assumption is in agreement with Hodges', Hodges explanation of attack transients. Subtle control of articulation is required from skilled musicians to modulate the attack during expressive performance. In figure two, the two graphs on the left show measured mouthpiece pressure and reed oscillations for tongue separated notes. The graphs on the right show the mouthpiece pressure and reed oscillations for air separated tones. It can be observed in the bottom left graph that during the tongue separated tones, the oscillations of the reed are not completely stopped and the same holds true for the mouthpiece pressure. This implies that mouthpiece pressure and reed oscillation are directly related to one another. This also proves that the tongue is not stopping the sound, but rather suppressing the reed vibrations which dampen the sound. The reed oscillations for air separated tones on the bottom right of figure two are much different than when using the tongue. The reed displacement in this example tapers more gradually towards equilibrium, which is also true for the behavior of the mouthpiece pressure in the top right graph. The mouthpiece pressure for air separated tones gets closer to zero, meaning less sound is happening during note transitions than when using the tongue. The tapering to zero pressure is more gradual, however, meaning that it takes longer to separate notes using only air. This can inform single reed musicians on when it may be appropriate to use tongued articulation versus air articulation. If wanting a crisper articulation with a quicker release, then one may find that use of the tongue would be more effective. If the speed of the release needs to be slower, as in a legato articulation, then air separated articulation may be more effective. Of course, other musical variables like tempo and dynamics would need to be considered before choosing the appropriate approach. This will be dis discussed in a study next. So how do musical parameters like dynamics and tempo affect attack and release? In the previous study, the effect of mouthpiece pressure and reed displacement were observed for two articulation techniques, and they were portato with the tongue and portato with only air. As was mentioned, the variables of dynamics and tempi were missing from their observations. With the addition of researcher Montserrat Pami Villa, the two researchers, Hoffman and Chachianu, attempt to answer the question of how do different parameters of music affect attack and release? Their new study, Analysis of Tonguing and Blowing Actions During Clarinet Performance, was published in the Frontier of Psychology Journal in 2018, five years after their previous investigation. The researchers claim in this study that the articulation controls the duration of the notes and the characteristics of the attack and release envelope. The influence of various playing conditions on the different parameters of articulation are quantified by an analysis of variance, also known as an ANOVA, which was developed by statistician Ronald Fisher in 1992. The following abbreviations are used for this ANOVA analysis. N represents N analysis analyzes the influence N effects has on a dependent variable. For example, if portato articulation is the dependent variable, N would represent either dynamics or tempo in relation to that variable. F is the F factor quantifying the influence of an effect on the variable. P is the P value which expresses the significance of the influence. 
when p is less than 0.05, then it can be concluded a significant effect is happening, which also indicates a high F factor. Another way of thinking of it is the closer p is to zero, then the more significant of an influence is occurring. Eta squared is a standardized measure of the magnitude of an effect. When eta squared is 0.02, that indicates a small effect. When eta squared is 0.13, that is a medium effect, and 0.26 or higher is a large effect. This means that the closer eta squared is to 1.0, the larger the effect. A t-test was used to graph and compare two conditions, and it is reported as seen in figure three. Regarding the portato articulation, a two-way ANOVA in graph A of figure three shows a significant influence of dynamics on attack time. For this comparison, P is less than 0 0.001, which also indicates a high F factor and an eta, eta squared measurement of 0.82. A significant magnitude of effect would be eta squared equaling 0.26 or higher. So with a measurement of 0.82, that means portato attack time is heavily influenced by dynamics. As you can see in graph A on the left, when doing a forte portato articulation, the attack time is about 40 milliseconds compared to a potato articulation at a piano dynamic is 47 milliseconds. This shows that for this test, a 0 0.07 millisecond difference indicates a significant influence. It is worth noting 0 0.07 milliseconds is an incredibly short amount of time. The fact that this small amount of time indicates a significant influence tells us how a small change in the attack envelope can impact the character of articulation. This also tells us that portato articulation has a faster attack envelope when performed more loudly. Another interesting discovery is the relationship between tempo and dynamics. For this comparison, P is less than 0.05 with an eta squared measurement of 0.5. While this still is a significant influence, it is not as significant as the previous relationship between dynamics and portato articulation. This can be ex explained again by looking at the graph A. For the forte portato articulation, dynamics and tempo had a significant relationship, as can be seen by the physical distance on the graph. However, the same cannot be said for dynamics and tempo when the portato articulation was performed at the piano dynamic. The physical distance between the two are much smaller. This indicates that attack time for portato articulation doesn't vary significantly when played softly, but it is significantly affected when played loudly. The same analysis for the release time of portato articulation can be observed on graph B. This graph shows no significant effect of tempo on release transients for portato articulation. This means that the attack time for portato articulation is related to both tempo and dynamic, but the release time is not related to either. Conversely, the start Staccato articulation in graph B in black shows that the staccato release time is is affected by tempo. Dynamics also had a highly significant effect on staccato attack time with P less than 0 0.001 and eta squared equaling 0.79. To summarize, for staccato articulation, fast tempo and forte dynamics present shorter attack time than slow tempo and piano dynamics. 
staccato articulation has a faster attack time than portato articulation with a longer release time. Musically, this means that if a quicker release is desired when playing staccato, the musician must work harder and maybe combine an air cutoff with a tongue cutoff to shorten the release. If articulating with a portato articulation, musicians have to be conscious that the attack time is slower, which is applicable to any chamber situation. The second part of their research examines how different methods of stopping the sound with either the tongue or air can affect the spectral content. The envelope of the sound in the mouthpiece drops exponentially when stopping the read with the tongue which will be called strategy one, as can be seen in figure four on the left. Conversely, when stopping the sound by decreasing mouthpiece pressure, which will be called strategy two, the release occurs gradually and linearly. This translates into shorter release times in strategy one than in strategy two. Regarding the spectral content, in strategy one, at the instant of tongue read contact, the upper harmonics are simultaneously dampened and only the low odd harmonics resonate in the tube until the sound completely stops, as can be seen in figure four. The odd numbers representing the odd numbered harmonics. Whereas in strategy two, the harmonics are dampened progressively from higher to lower frequencies during the mouth pressure decrease. It can also be observed that higher frequencies occur much longer during a release with the tongue than they would if releasing with air. Releasing with air in the second graph shows that the harmonics decrease from high to low, meaning the high harmonics are the first to dissipate. Lastly, it will be investigated how varying articulation techniques affect the way we perceive musical expression. In a study published in the Music Perception Journal in 2012 titled Timbre and Affect Dimensions, authors Tumas Irola, Rafael Feder, and Vinu Aluri discuss how different aspects of timbre influence our perception of music. The objective of the experiment was to find out what articulations produced low and high valence, as well as low and high energy measurements. A total of 105 instrument samples representing different sections of the symphony orchestra were chosen as stimuli from the Vienna Symphonic Library. The library includes sounds played at different dynamic levels, as well as in different registers with different techniques. The researchers predicted that sustained sounds characterized as plain, vibrato, and legato would lead to higher ratings of valence, but with lower ratings of energy. Articulations with a faster attack slope, characterized by sforzato, marcato, staccato, and pizzicato, would be rated higher on energy, but lower in valence. The data showed agreement among the candidates when listening to isolated instruments. The agreement was 0.96 for valence, 0.92 for energy arousal, 0.94 for tension arousal, 0.75 for intensity, and 0.93 for preference. Agreement for intensity was lower than what could be accepted at 0.75, so this concept was discarded from all further analyses. High consistencies among the rest of the affect ratings suggest that isolated instrument sounds contain adequate cues for perceiving the emotional expression. As shown in figure five, positively valenced sounds tended to have belonged to the slow attack category, which included plain, legato, and vibrato. Pizzicato was the outlier and the positively valent sounds also tended to have a longer decay and lower attack slopes. Energetic sounds were characterized by sharp attacks and bursts of energy in the initial parts of the envelope. Those were staccato, sforzato, and marcato, which received a little bit of a lower valence score. 
The articulation differences in valence ratings indicated mainly that the pizzicato sounds were the most favored in terms of valence, while the slow attack category was a slight favorite in terms of valence. The articulation differences in energy arousal were mostly as the researchers predicted. The impulse type envelopes, which are staccato, sforzato, pizzicato, and marcato, had higher ratings of energy arousal than those with sustained envelopes. This attests to the importance of articulation conveying affect by subtle changes in timbre and sound envelope. Here is some more evidence of articulation's effects on perception. This is another study that investigated the effects of articulation on musical perception and was done by Jason Silvera titled, The Effect of Varied Articulations on Listeners' Perceptions of Forcefulness of Attack and Length of Sustain. The goal of this study was to determine the effect of varied accent articulation marks on listeners' perceptions of forcefulness of attack and length of sustain. The control group was 68 instrumentalists, 46 of those were music majors, and 22 were non-music majors. They were asked to listen to a series of seven short musical excerpts in which a predefined set of pitches would be accented. Participants rated each example on a level of forcefulness of attack and length of sustain by using a five-point Likert scale, where five is the most forceful sounding. Results indicated significant differences between attack ratings and length of sustain ratings for the seven articulation marks. An inspection of the attack means in figure six reveals that marcato symbol was perceived as the most forceful overall with mean of 3.72 and standard deviation of 0.62. However, music majors as a group rated the combination of staccato and marcato articulation as the most forceful with a mean of four and a standard deviation of 0.76. Again, it's worth noting that the closer the number is to five, the more, the more in agreement the control group is. The staccato symbol was perceived as the least forceful articulation marking by both the non-music majors and music majors. Additionally, data were analyzed using a two-way separated measures ANOVA to test for differences between the non-music major group and the music major group across the seven examples. There was a significant reaction between major and stimuli for forcefulness of attack of 0.05 for a p-value and an eta squared of 0.4. This means that both groups generally interpreted forcefulness of the auditory stimuli similarly. Now that the importance of articulation's role when shaping the attack and release transients of a sound envelope has been explained, the effects of sound envelope manipulation will be explored. This last study by Phyllis M. Paul is a replication and extension of Charles A. Elliott's research titled Attacks and Releases as Identifying Factors in Musical Instrument Identification identification. In Paul's research, it was published in the Research and Music Education Journal. Paul examined the effects of manipulating sound envelope components on high school band students' abilities to identify wind instruments. The instruments were oboe, bassoon, B-flat clarinet, tenor saxophone, trumpet, horn, trombone, euphonium, and tuba. The study group was 58 students, and they were presented with recordings of instruments under three conditions, each in a random order. The first condition presented stimuli without attack and releases of the sound envelope, and students identified instruments using free response. This is shown in Table 1. Condition 2 also presented stimuli without attacks and releases but subjects were provided with a reference list of instruments. 
This is shown in Table 2. Condition 3 included only two seconds of the initial attacks and the reference list, and this is shown in Table 3. As in Elliott's study, clarinet and oboe were among the most correctly identified instruments, and presence of the initial sound increased students' overall abilities to recognize instruments. Another significant discovery is that students identified their own instrument timbre more consistently than did others, regardless of condition. Only the sustains are presented in Table 1, with no reference list. In this study, oboe was confused with trumpet, bassoon was confused with horn, clarinet was accurately identified. Tenor saxophone was correctly identified with the second highest number of votes thinking it was a bassoon. Trumpet was mistaken for French horn. Trombone was mistaken for euphonium and tuba was mistaken for euphonium. Table two is pretty much the same as Table 1, but students were given a reference list. This solidified the fact that horn was the most mistaken instrument out of all three examples. Table 3 increased the accuracy significantly due to hearing the first two seconds of the attack envelope. These findings show that when presented with the attack transient of an envelope, listeners are much more likely to correctly identify instrument sounds. This effect can be observed by the increased accuracy of Table 3. The importance of knowing this information can come in handy for any group of musicians trying to either create a homogeneous blend or bring out certain color contrasts. In conclusion, articulation plays an important role when shaping the attack and release transients of a sound envelope. These differences in attack and release can be made into spectrographs that provide a visual representation of what musicians are hearing. The use of these visual representations in single read ped pedagogy can inform students about not only how they should sound, but what the sound should look like. Considering the vastly different learning preferences for students, this seems like the next logical step to improve music and acoustic education. The attack and release of notes is also so critically important that it helps listeners identify the sounds they are hearing. This knowledge can immediately benefit students who are wondering how they can imitate the sound of another instrument or play with a color that contrasts an ensemble. In future research, it might even be beneficial to take playing style into account when observing sound envelopes. Do jazz players start notes or transition between notes differently? How about rock and roll? Obviously, there is an infinite amount of research that can still be done on this topic. Thank you for listening to my presentation, and hopefully this will somehow influence your teaching and performing.